Good morning. Good morning, Samson. Uh, uh, Good thank morning. Thank you for deeming me uh, worthy uh, of a slot uh, on this program uh, about change statements. I have chosen uh, to speak today on the question of our political parties. And I don't frame it as our political parties and democracy. Actually, I frame it as our political parties versus our democracy. But it is not exactly clear to me at this point, given the evidence that uh, is before us, and that has been before us in the last 30 years of this, uh, of this new democratic project. It's not exactly clear to me that we have come to see parties as performing the kind of role that we envisioned for them. When 30 years ago, we went to a referendum and voted ourselves a new constitution. Which new constitution cleared the way for the unbanning of political parties in readiness for the 1992 general elections? Subsequent to that, those elections, a newly elected government assumed office January 7, 1993. And brought with it multi-party democracy. Now, we've been a, a party people for quite some time. Uh, it goes way back into our history. Polka parties uh, first emerged in Ghana during the Gold Coast years, and not as we usually assume uh, in the post-Second World, World War period. They actually started much earlier uh, in municipal elections. So when the colonial government opened the door in some selected uh, urban centers or cities and towns to uh, elections, to seats on town council, parties began to emerge, you know, Red Payers Association, Mambi, and all of those groups. But at the national level, of course, we date the formation of polka parties in Ghana uh, to the event culminating in the breakaway of the Convention's People Party, CPP, from the United Gold Coast Convention. At the time, of course, again, the trigger for this was impending elections. We were, for the first time, going to have open elections into a legislative assembly. And that was the impetus for parties to form. So party formation has something to do with the right, having a right to elect representatives into a legislative assembly or into, into, into political office. Now, we've had quite a bit of seesaw with parties. So after independence, uh, you know, the, the dominant uh, view, the dominant elite view represented by the Nkrumah and the CPP, where that multi parties were uh, divisive, um, we were a country in a hurry. We couldn't afford uh, the kind of division that we thought uh, the argument then was that parties brought with them. And also that we needed to harness all of our limited resources, human and others, uh, to execute the project of development, which was really the most pressing issue at the time. So the idea, which was not only in Ghana, but it was actually a conventional kind of wisdom at the time was that you know, we should do away with multi-parties and have just one party. That one party is supposedly going to represent all of us. So we had one party state. And of course, uh, uh, we also moved on with coup d'etat. Uh, we then had no party government. You know, military regimes are essentially no party governments. Parties are abolished during that period. And so we've tried one party state. We've tried no party government. And in fact, at one point, one of those regimes attempted um, an innovative uh, idea. I mean, in terms of, as far as Ghanaian political science goes, I guess that's probably the most innovative idea that has come from, from, from the country, which is um, a union government, uh, a, a no party, civilian, uh, military police kind of government. All of us, you know, basically working together. It's, a referendum was held, um, you know, the, the, the outcome of which was somewhat dubious, the project failed. So we've, we've tried, we rejected union government. 
And now, of course, each time we have restored, uh, we have restored democracy, we have done it on the basis of multiple parties. Because we think that parties represent something good. And in fact, in the 1992 constitution, um, parties are the only private associations for which the constitution actually makes uh, you know, substantial uh, provision for how it must be shaped and formed and, and the like, right? Some internal rules and the like. So when you, when you look at Article 55 on the chapter of the representation of people, a whole 17 clauses are devoted to political parties. No other private association of people in the country gets that kind of mention in the constitution which tells us that we think parties are special. Uh, they are not just private entities or such, they are special. And the character of the party is important to the character, is, a, is an important determinant of the character of the democracy that we're going to have. So we try to make, we try to make a few rules about how those parties must behave or how they, they must look like. And then when you go to the provision on the constitution on uh, in chapter six on directive principles of state policy, parties are also explicitly mentioned as among those institutions, non-states albeit, that must be guided in their behavior and, and others by those directive principles of state policy. So article 34.1 uh, names parties along with the president, cabinets and all of that as among those bodies to, to think about the natural principles of state policy in their conduct. So 30 years after the fact, after this democratic project, I think it's a long enough time to do some appraisal of where we think we are with our parties. Are they a force for good in our democracy? Are they behaving as we would expect them to do in our, our democracy? Are they helping us sustain our democracy? And of course, one could argue that, you know, with parties, we have been able so far to have orderly transitions of power from one regime to the other, um, you know, over some successive period. So you could say that parties have contributed to that kind of orderly transition of power through the ballot box, and that's fine. But I think increasingly, parties are also beginning to leave a sour taste in the mouth of many Ghanaians. Hmm. And why do I say that? So there are a few pieces of evidence to support that proposition. We have recently tried, there's been quite a clamor for the democratization of local government through the election of municip metropolitan, municipal, and district chief executives. That whole project has stalled because a strong majority of Ghanaians are opposed to the entry of political parties into our local government space. So, you know, survey after survey, you know, by CDD, by NTC, by IDEC, show that Ghanaians do not want political parties. And when you ask them, I mean, the debates that we had, including, you know, on social media around the referendum that was called off uh, in December 2019 about parties. Even civil society organizations, pro-democracy civil society organizations, were, were strongly opposed mm. to the involvement of parties. Ghanaians have also not been warm to the idea of public funding for parties. Whenever it has been thrown up, there's huge opposition to the idea. And then you see that a substantial number of Ghanaian voters are so you know, uh, frustrated with the absence of checks and balances between our parliament and the executive branch that they think that the solution to that is to divide those branches between two parties. So all of these are evidences that somewhat our parties are not, have not impressed us and that we would really are having a rethink. I don't even know if today, if you had the union government referendum today, uh, how it would look like, whether Ghanaians would actually go for a no party state. And in fact, a, a strong, an emerging constituency of youth voters, young people, 
are beginning to entertain ideas of you know, democracy, but without parties, not just here, but, you know, in many other places. So I think this is causing me uh, as a Democrat you know, to really uh, uh, you know, ask ourselves, uh, it's causing me some uh, you know, uh, apprehension and I, I'm, I'm worried about what it is that uh, we're getting from our party. So for me, this idea of political parties, um, it's, not as, it's not as though we are rejecting parties per se. And in fact, we did a, a recently a focus group, some focus group discussions across the country on this idea of why to, to really tease out why people don't want political parties, for example, in local government elections. And when you push the idea, when you push them, present different scenarios and options, what you get is, is a sense that it is not political parties per se, it is certain behaviors, certain tendencies that our parties have ex exhibited and have shown themselves to exhibit. That is actually putting people off. And what are those behaviors? So tension during elections, each time we have general elections coming up, we approach it with a lot of apprehension and anxiety. Mm. Why? Because it has become almost the equivalent of war, for, especially for our two main rival parties. Election violence and political party vigilantism, a term that we didn't, you know, have you know, our, in our democratic nomenclature, but for parties, you know, a, a lot of, you know, apprehension about election violence and vigilantism. And even in internal party primaries, we have begun to see, you know, incidents and high risk of such, some such violence. Our parties and partisans have exploited and exacerbated pre-existing conflicts across the country, chieftaincy disputes and others. Every little thing is now given, every little conflict soon, sooner than later takes on a party flavor. This is beginning to heighten polarization in our society. In between elections, what are we seeing uh, with our parties? We may not have a de jure one party uh, state, and we don't, but we do have a party state now. Mm. And the party states, uh, the, our party states operates essentially as a one party state just in four year increments. The party that wins power, and, when, and I'm, I'm talking not just about winner takes all, but there's a certain party first ideology and agenda that has replaced the national and public interest as the guiding principle in, in, governing, in governance. In the 1960s, the slogan was the CPP is Ghana and Ghana is the CPP. Today, when the NPP is in power, the NPP is Ghana and Ghana is the NPP. And when the arrivals take over, Ghana becomes the NDC and the NDC becomes Ghana. Hmm. The party card has become more valuable than the Ghana card. Just look at the sheer amount of investment in advertising and other carrots and sticks we had to throw in for the average Ghanaian to go and queue for a Ghana card. The party card, for the party card, you don't need advertisement at all. In fact, they, they won't even, they will, they will hide it from you. It's a very scarce commodity. The demand far outstrips the supply. And the supply is kept actually intentionally low by the party executives, because really our parties are not that interested in members. They just want voters. They just want you to vote for them. Members, you know, the fewer the merrier. So there's a number of developments that we're seeing. Protocol based on partisan criteria has now come to replace meritocratic and open recruitment into our public services and state enterprises. And what we are talking here is how scarce livelihood, livelihood opportunities in a very low job creation economy are distributed. And they are distributed now, you know, basically according to partisan criteria. So you see that the party and the state has become basically synonymous. And there is this clear state capture by our parties. And there are no secret cows in this. All public institutions are up for grabs. Universities, you know, I mean, everywhere. 
everywhere, even in student, student unions. It is, the, the capture is proceeding uh, apace. It has made fighting corruption and even sometimes just ordinary criminality difficult, very difficult, if not impossible, because once it emerges that a party person is involved, and it doesn't even have to be some big oligarch or campaign, you know, sometimes just the local, it becomes difficult to actually proceed with the appropriate uh, criminal liability or punishment. So impunity is running amok because parties and partisans are making it difficult to enforce the law. They become team gods above the law. Parliament is supposed to be an oversight body, but parliament is not a uniparty organization. And to the extent that there are rivals parties there, they have failed basically in their work as a check on the executive because the party of the executive basically almost always predictably goes along with the executive agenda. We see a lot of party militias and foot soldiers engaging in thuggery. Difference between campaigning and governance has all but disappeared. We have almost like a permanent campaign even when elections are over. The next four years, it's not just for governing. Every time it's for campaigning as well. So when you put all of this together, it appears to a lot of Ghanaians that the, now when we vote, what do we vote for practically? We vote practically essentially for which group of partisans and their kin and associates to make rich, to put above the law, to make untouchable in our society. This is definitely not what we signed up for when we signed up for democracy with parties in April 1992. Instead of democracy as government of the people, by the people, for the people, today the people matter largely as subjects and as voters once every four years. In the period in between and after elections, Democracy has become in large measure government by the party and partisans for the party and partisans. And I worry because we're seeing globally, including our region, a certain recession, democratic recession. We have been spared some of the events that have happened elsewhere, democratic collapse in other societies. But collapse is not we shouldn't collapse before we know, before we get worried. The degradation of the quality of our democracy is for me what matters. Absolutely. And we still have time and opportunity, right? To, to make, you know, to, to, to change course. All right. To, to make it the appropriate correction and to change course. All right. You know? and, and I think also, you know, one of the reasons that this, this has to matter to us mm. is that while we may not, admit it, and we hate oftentimes to admit the truth. Our parties too, our two main rival parties especially, despite appearances to the contrary, are in significant respects rival ethno-regional coalitions. Thereby, you know, so it, it, it exacerbates the implications of some of these behaviors. So that, for example, if you distribute scarce public resources, like jobs and the other, and the like, according to partisan criteria, what you're also doing is laying, I mean, giving a certain ethno-regional coloration okay. the distribution of opportunities in our society. All so right. all of these things, when you put that together, we are really, I think our parties are behaving in a way that is giving democracy a bad name, They're taking democracy for granted. They are some of the biggest beneficiaries of our democracy since 1993, and yet, in my view, are not behaving in ways that ensure the long-term sustainability of this democratic project. Okay. Thank you so very much, Professor H. Kwesi Prempe. I'm going to speak on the need for constitutional amendment. And as you mentioned, uh, this is the view, my view, and indeed the view of the party that I represented in 2020. Mm. So I'd like to thank you, Samson, Joy FM, and Newsfile, for this opportunity to make the statement on national issues and my attempt to make some proposals with respect to good governance and how we can reap rapidly 
the benefits of a democratic society. I think that the previous speaker before me, HKP, has mentioned a lot of the things, uh, but I would add, like to add to them as well. Mm. So we will begin with our constitution. Recently, we were patting ourselves on the back and on, and on marking 30 years of the adoption of the 1992 constitution as the basis of our current democracy and the Fourth Republic. 30 years, well done to us indeed. Mm. But such an agreement between the governors and the people would and should normally reflect well-negotiated terms that are fair to both the people and their government, equal or almost equal partners in national development. However, a closer look at the current constitution presents a worrisome spectacle of a predatory relationship between the government and the people. Our constitution is lopsided. And the power scale is so much tilted in favor of the governors or elected officials, or as we call them today, the political elite. As a result, we, the people, have not enjoyed the full benefits of a democratic state in the terms of the adequate provision of social services, water, electricity, basic roads in our communities. I live in Teshinungwa State. <laughs> residential areas, a nationwide well-functioning public education system and health systems and well-resourced district assemblies, effective systems of accountability, an efficient body of public service officers who treat citizens with respect and dignity, safe interregional motorways, decent housing, jobs for the youth, political accountability, reduction in corruption, stability of the currency, and overall, a good standard of living. There are indicators for measuring the success or otherwise of a democracy, and not a mere periodic conduct of elections and the successive peaceful transition or transfer of power from one administration to the other. Our 30-year democratic experience has registered has rather registered massive levels of youth unemployment, excessive and unfettered executive powers, a compromised parliament, abuse of power, unbridled corruption, waste of garnered resources, nepotism, mediocrity, mismanagement of the economy, and a constant failure of leadership. In fact, the current constitution, in my view, has created a situation where the winning political parties are, have treated the republic as a colony to be conquered, hmm. and its resources taken for the welfare of the few privileged members, the political elite of the pa party in power, depriving the significant majority of Ghanaians the dividends of a well-constituted democratic state. I think HKP said it, that the stability of the country is threatened by the youth, of course, by this situation and an intensely exclusionary political system where citizenship is no longer a requirement or enough requirement to have access to the state resources and to partake in the sharing of the national cake. A, a citizen must necessarily, as HKP said, require membership of the party in power to benefit from the welfare state. We risk losing the continued support and defense of this, constitu this constitution has enjoyed from the people. And in fact, people are getting disgruntled. If we do not take steps to correct some of the defects identified within the present constitution. So some of some important areas for constitutional amendments where there are defects and we must amend would mm. include these five fundamental changes that need immediate attention to guarantee some modicum of progress if Ghana is to gain or get any dividends in our last democratic experiment. The five areas are as follows. Return power to the people 
for all Ghanaians to directly elect their district municipal and metropolitan chief executives without any interference from the president and council government appointees into the district assembly. To prohibit members of parliament from being appointed as ministers of state or else MPs must resign from parliament after their ministerial appointment. To strengthen the office of Attorney General by separating it from the Ministry of Justice. Four, introduce a public declaration of assets regime. And five, clarify the eligibility of Ghanaians in the diaspora to hold public office. Let's start with the MMDCs, the election of the MMDCs. Mm. It would be superfluous to recount the benefits of electing directly and by universal adult suffrage all our metropolitan, municipal, and district chief executives, as well as all the members of the district assemblies. In addition, the concept of governmental appointees should be completely abolished. The matter has been flogged over the years with elected governments demonstrating a lack of political will to empower the districts to elect their chief executive officers who are true agents of development. As someone said, no one wants to preside over their own demise. So rather, the members of parliament whose job is to pass legislation have arrogated to themselves the role of development agents with no constitutionally allocated resources. And indeed, the people have started to believe that it's the MP who will develop their districts. The result is that MPs have resorted to all kinds of unorthodox ways and policy violations to attempt to bring some piecemeal development to the people. For example, the office of the chief executive has become a trophy to be won mm. and hijacked by elected political parties to reward party members who could neither become members of parliament nor ministers of state. The practice has been for political party leaders to travel around the country to vet and establish the loyalty of DCE applicants mm. to the party in power. In other words, loyalty to the party is the main consideration for appointment as district chief executive. The election of district chief executives is long overdue because it remains a, democ a democratic deficit and a major imp impediment in the development of the various smaller units that constitute Ghana. It will ensure that all resources allocated by the Constitution through the District Assembly Common Fund are demanded by the elected officers and same sense to the district promptly for local development. As it stands now, I think the District Assembly Common Fund is almost three quarters in arrears. It will ensure local accountability, elimination of corruption, and rapid development. If citizens are capable of electing the president, who is high above them, and members of parliament, they should be credited with the wisdom to decide who governs them at the local level, surely. Denying the good people of Ghana their power following the aborted referendum whether or not MMDC should be elected on a partisan basis must be viewed as a coup d'etat, indeed, against the people of Ghana by the political class. The question of a partisan election of MMDCs or otherwise can only be answered by Ghanaians at a referendum so no one can deny Ghanaians that opportunity under the pretext of a lack of consensus. As it was said by the previous speaker, Ghanaians have indeed become uh, distrustful of political parties anyway. So they have decided that they do not want to do this on a partisan basis. And if we want to test the veracity of that, maybe we should put it to a, a referendum. How else can we know the position of Ghanaians on this matter other than through a referendum? No president or any other member of the political class should use the partisan debate to conveniently deflect the urgent need for all DCEs plus all assembly members to be elected freely and by universal adult suffrage. 
For the avoidance of doubt, we can actually elect our chief executives without going for a referendum. All that we need to do now is for parliaments to amend Articles 242D, which deals with the appointment of one third of assembly members and Articles 2431 and 2433, which deals with the appointments or, in quotes, disappointment of the chief executive. Making a referendum on Article, Article 55.3, which prohibits political parties from local government elections, a precondition for electing MMDCs, is mischievous and a calculated attempt to postpone once again a very constitutional amendment. So at this point, government should choose patriotism over partisanship and allow people of Ghana to elect their own DCs. If we want Ghanaians to allow political parties to participate in the local elections, the referendum will show for that. This major step in amending Article 243 will be the least the political holders can do to demonstrate a commitment to, co to ceding power to the people. The second one is to separate MPs from ministers by amending Article 78.1. We advocate strongly the concept of strict separation of powers because the current arrangement, where the 1992 constitution by design bequeathed parliament to the executive, has hampered parliament's ability to exact accountability from the executive on behalf of the people. Article 78.1 mandates the president to appoint majority of his ministers from parliament. This means that more than half of all the ministers and deputy ministers must be members of parliament. So every member of parliament indeed looks up to the president for a ministerial appointment and therefore their immediate priority is not to check the government against malfeasance, but to catch the eye of the president for appointment. Mm. Or look the other way where, where, where as it may apply. This has resulted in a compromised parliament, which is obviously ineffective in scrutinizing the activities of the executives to guarantee the judicious application of the nation's resources. For example, apart from ministerial appointments, some members of parliament are appointed as chair and members of board of directors of state-owned enterprises, corporations, and other institutions thereby compromising the supervisory role of parliament, public accounts committee, uh, cases of corruption. These are the same people sitting in there. These appointments to buy loyalty blur the lines of checks and balances. The proposal is that if a member of parliament is appointed as a minister or accepts any other appointment by the president, then he or she must resign his seat before taking up the appointment. People seeking to become public officers must choose to either become part of the legislature or the executive, not both. Attorney General, amending Article 88. Article 88 of the Constitution should be amended to separate the Attorney General from the Minister of Justice, or more specifically, the Attorney General must not be a Minister of State or a member of the government. We believe that making the Attorney General a Minister of State compromises his or her ability to fight and prosecute political corruption. The failure of the Special Prosecutor's Office and its lack of independence has been made clear to the Ghanaian electorate by now. What we need to fight political what we need to fight political corruption effectively is the immediate establishment of the independent public prosecutor's office, separate from the Minister of Justice. This is the only way to realistically fight corruption. A truly independent attorney general or independent public prosecutor who will have a budget sanctioned by parliament without any ministerial interference. No amount of political spinning or propaganda can make the current 
Office of the Special Prosecutor independent of the Attorney General and by extension independent of the Executive. It is evident from our past experience that it would be fruitless to leave the fight against corruption in the hands of an elected government and its appointees. For this reason, the independent public prosecutor should be elected directly by the people to check the governments against political corruption. The, pub the people's prosecutor will be elected on a different electoral cycle, preferably during the midterm of an elected government. The independent public prosecutor will be given the vast prosecutorial powers with guaranteed tenure, independence, and adequate funding from parliaments to go after uh, corrupt government officials. The government's own lawyer then will be the Minister of Justice. Public declaration of assets. Another tool in the fight against corruption is effective assets declaration regime, an effective assets declaration regime. The current process where asset declaration forms and its contents are concealed is laughable and ironic. How does one publicly declare something while concealing it at the same time? The recommendation of the Constitution Review Commission for a new assets declaration regime where the completed forms are published and can be accessed by any interested citizen for the purpose of verification is in order. The Constitution Review Commission also recommended criminal prosecution for false declaration, mm -hmm. a duty proposed, a duty the proposed independent public prosecutor will gladly take on board. We need to confront political corruption head on if we want to safeguard this last attempt as constitutional democracy. Public declaration of assets should be the minimum threshold for any aspiring public office holder to meet as a condition to hold in trust massive public assets and resources of the republic. If one cannot declare her relatively small assets to the citizens, then she has no right to take charge of huge public assets. Ghanaians in the diaspora, lastly. Ghanaian citizens are Ghanaian citizens, whether they hold dual nationality or not. In fact, their citizenship of Ghana cannot be debased by virtue of the fact that they hold dual nationality. Dual nationality is secondary to citizenship. Mm -hmm. We must introduce an amendment to the Constitution to clarify and allow Ghanaians living in the diaspora to be fully elig eligible to participate in the democratic process. This will ensure full citizenship rights to Ghanaians living abroad so that they can vote and serve in public sector positions. There is no justi justification whatsoever to deny our kith and kin such rights when they pour into our economy huge sums of foreign exchange by way of remittances to family and friends. We should be reminded that on many occasions we have sought and continue to seek the expertise of skills and skills of Ghanaians in the diaspora in the area of sports, medicine, engineering, finance, academia, international relations, economic development, and other areas of consultancy services in different sectors of our national life. We must restore full citizenship rights to our sisters and brothers in the diaspora and clarify provisions on their qualification to become public office holders. In conclusion, it is said that every living thing must grow as it ages. <laughs> Anything that ages but does not grow stagnates and dies. That is the case of our 30-year-old constitution, which has aged but not grown. We cannot continue to apply the same principles of a fledgling democracy emerging from a military regime with near dictatorial rule to after eight successive or success, successful elections, almost eight. The massive amount of money invested in the constitutional review exercise must not be allowed to go to waste. 
It shall remain a scar on the conscience of right-thinking Ghanaians, like you and I, if these fundamental changes and many other brilliant recommendations contained in the CRC's report continue to gather dust. We owe it to ourselves and the next generation to secure and safeguard our democracy. And that can only be achieved through these amendments. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, the, for the privilege and the opportunity to be here. Uh, amazing submissions already. Uh, so I want to speak on why as a nation, I feel that we are sitting on gold and begging for brass. Uh, knowing everything you know about Ghana, everything from politics to religion, to culture, to education, to health, knowing everything you know about the state of affairs in this country now, I want you to imagine, based on the truth you know, where Ghana will be in 20 years. Considering the trajectory we're on, where will we be in 30 years, in 40 years? What future will our children inherit? We are selling all our forests, cutting down all the trees. We are pouring concrete everywhere. Our sea is full of plastic waste. Our fishermen catch more plastic than fish nowadays. Artisans can't find apprentices. Our young people are sports betting their future away or selling their bodies on social media. They call it hookups or looking for a way to get out of this hot country. Yes, the country is hot. But nothing changes, but if nothing changes now, can you imagine how much hotter things will be in 20 years? What kind of Ghana will our children have? Ever since Europeans discovered Elmina in 19, sorry, in 1471, we have never been the same again. Uh, before they came, we were not Ghanaians. We were tribes and clans and many beautiful languages. Uh, today, what are we? We are struggling to define exactly what it means to be a Ghanaian. If, if Ghana was a brand, it's a struggling one. It's, it still lacks a clear identity and definition. What does it mean to be a Ghanaian? What does it mean to live on God's most blessed land, fertile from border to border, gold laden from north to south, and yet beg for brass. Why do we sit on gold and beg for brass? Uh, some years ago, uh, I was in The Hague, and a Dutch politician, finding out I was from Ghana, walked up to me and said, I hear you're from Ghana. I said, yes. And he said, one of your ministers was here last week to beg for money. You know, and in my mind, I was like, I bet he went in a three-piece suit to beg for the money so they can buy fleets of Lanquista V8s so they can pretend there are no potholes on the road they constructed just the year before, half of which has already eroded. <laughs> you know, uh, I was embarrassed and cynical, I have to say. But many things about this country uh, also inspire me. There are many things that break my heart, but many also inspire me. In Sierra Leone, during the campaign that brought Mada Bio into power, I heard one of the politicians on radio yelling, vote for me. When I become president, I will improve health care. No longer will our people go to America for treatment. No longer will our people go to uh, London for treatment. No longer will our people go to Ghana for treatment. <laughs> Ghana. Yes, Ghana's healthcare system supports more than just Ghanaians. A lot of our brothers and sisters across the sub-region come here for medical, medical care and tourism. We are doing some things right. All hope is not lost yet. My objective for being here this morning is to find like-minded folk who can commit to our collective development Outside the dictates and promises of politics, I am not a, a politician. I'm just a photojournalist who 
roams the continent. Uh, I'm the pastor. And people, I'm looking for people who are eager to continue this conversation even beyond this event. How do we move this nation forward? Today, corruption pulls us back like an oversized hernia dangling between a runner's legs. Uh, our economic bucket has been leaking since the days of Kwame Nkrumah, and now the bucket has lost its bottom. <laughs> so no matter how much you pour in, it all leaks out. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. The e-levy, that too will leak out, just like everything else, unless we change. <laughs> Sometimes it's not more you need, it is integrity and wisdom you need. In my humble opinion, I think all Ghanaians are corrupt to some degree, different degrees, but we are tolerant of corruption. Integrity and honesty have never been virtues we've truly valued, nurtured, or rewarded. Kweku Anansi is our hero. He is crafty and selfish, and we admire him more than the pious, gentle, meek and mild Jesus many of us claim to follow. We are more Kukwanansi children than we might want to admit. Fellow Ghanaians, let me borrow the, that very uh, famous expression, <laughs> fellow Ghanaians, why are we corrupt? We are corrupt because we get away with it. We are corrupt because we have forgotten who we truly are. The average Ghanaian today cannot go back three generations. If you ask them, what is the name of your great grandparents? Many will stare at you blankly. They don't know. Ask them to say 1,234,378 in their mother tongue. They can't. Now, if you can't go back three generations, how can you go forward three generations? How can you think about the future? The future of your children, the future of your grandchildren, the future of your great grandchildren. As a nation, I think we are myopic. Colonialism stripped us of our identity and told us we were less than. So we spend precious money on extravagant trifles, fancy houses, expensive cars, and designer clothing just so we can get some respect. In fact, even when we invest our money in expensive Western education, keep up their certificates and titles, all we become are copies of someone else. Educated, colonized Africans we will never be British enough, we'll never be American enough, we'll never be white, we will never be truly accepted. And as long as we remain copies, we should know that it is always the original that fetches great value. Nobody pays enough money for copies. But what does it mean to be an original? What does it mean to be an original, authentic Ghanaian? How does that even look like? My dear friends, the word of the average Ghanaian is like the promise a man makes at his pinnacle of bliss. He doesn't remember it afterwards. I think as a nation, we have a cognitive dissonance issue and it threatens our future. Cognitive dissonance is when the choir is singing, joy to the world, the Lord is come. But if you watch the faces of the choristers singing, you think they just bit into some unforgiving lemon. Cognitive dissonance is when you lock your shop to go and pray the whole day for God to bless your business. It is when you pay tithe or do sadaqah from stolen money or say God bless you after collecting a bribe. Cognitive dissonance is when we show up at 8, 8.30, 9, 10 for a 7 o'clock meeting until we develop a new culture where a person's word is their bond. Mm. And people are held accountable for their words and actions and expect to be held accountable for the promises they make, whether on a political platform or from the pulpit of a church or in the privacy of their home or at the business table. 
unless we start expecting accountability for the words we speak, mediocrity will continue to be our bane. Some years ago, I was hired to photograph a road project that connected some African countries. The roads from Addis Ababa to Moyali, this is where Addis Ababa, uh, Ethiopia and Kenya meet. The road from Addis Ababa to Moyali was perfect. So I thought to myself, this is Ethiopia. The contractor knows if they do a shoddy job, they go to jail. That's why they've done an excellent job. And then I entered the Kenyan part of that, that road, that same road. And from Moyali, the Kenyan part of, of, of Moyali, all the way to Nairobi, the road was just as good as Ethiopia's. The last part of that assignment was the Fufufu Solar Road. Have you seen that road? Have you been on it? Ghana has many problems, but we don't actually need many solutions. Today, hospitals get away with it when patients who shouldn't die, do die. The poor who can't afford sheep and goats struggle to get justice. Politics is like kokofu football. If you don't have a brother in the game, you don't get a pass. Adults who should know better thought it was okay to sabotage the future of two Rastafarian kids because they won't cut their locks. We are a petty people. And the more powerful we get, the pettier we become. When are we starting serious conversations on respect and tolerance? Tolerance for those who believe different. Isn't it weird that the first, that first and foremost, a church will build prisons and then send their lawyers to go and argue for homosexuals to be jailed? Are we Pharisees or Christians? If we are Christians, then shouldn't Christ be our example? And when will we hold the syndicates that beg with children all across our cities accountable? They exploit these children under the guise of Islam. Able-bodied adults beg with vulnerable children, and we all do nothing. You find some of them begging just a few meters from where our president lives. What future will these children have? What kind of Ghanaians are they going to be as adults? And when are we going to feel shame for every woman we see carrying loads on their heads? Our women, our daughters, sisters, and wives are not donkeys. They are not beasts of burden. When are we going to be enraged enough to change the Kayayo culture? As a father and a pastor, I can tell you for a fact, fellow Ghanaians, that the hypocrisy of a parent damages a child's faith in God much quicker than any temptation out there. I have seen what religious extremism can do. I have documented the impact of jihadist activities in Gundam in Northern Mali, in Dori and Kaya in Burkina Faso. Uh, I can tell you story after story of how unstable this region is. Ghana isn't as safe as we think it is. The harder life gets for the vulnerable Ghanaian, the greater the risk of them being recruited by those who seek to capture West Africa through terrorism. As long as we stay petty, self-serving and corrupt, others will feast on our gold and we'll keep begging them for brass. I dream and see a Ghana where our people are truly proud of who they are. Yes, our names may be different, our languages may be different, our faiths may be different, but at heart, we'll be the same good people, share the same vision and work together to create a better future for our children. I know it won't be easy, but it is not impossible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samson, and good day to my viewers and my listeners. My topic for today poses a question, as you rightly pointed out, and the question is, where are our public intellectuals? I pose this question cognizant of the fact that public intellectuals are essential to the definition the quality and direction of public discourse and by extension, public policy. I try to very briefly outline who a public intellectual is and why the media in particular have an essential role to play in making the impact of the public intellectual fully felt. So having said that, let me dig straight <clears throat> into the substantive argument. Aristotle considers Sophocles, one of the greatest dramatists in the world and described one of his classics, Oedipus Rex, 
as the best tragedy ever attributed. In Oedipus Rex, from which the psychological affliction Oedipus complex is derived, Sophocles created a dramatic moment when Oedipus, the king of Thebes, summons a blind seer. His name is Theresias. And he summons him to his palace to divine why Thebes was in such turmoil. The previous king, Laos, son of Labdacos, had been killed by highway robbers, according to accounts. And since Oedipus took over as a king and married Laos's widow Jocasta, the kingdom had known no peace. Oedipus sends embassies to Phoebus to inquire what should be done. And the oracle divines that the killer of Laos be found and killed or banished before peace can be restored in Thebes. Oedipus therefore called Teresias over to use, and I quote, law sacred and profane, all heavenly and earthly knowledge in his grasp, end of quote, to save the city from further affliction. Teresias declares Oedipus the cause of the affliction publicly declaring him the cursed polluter of the land. Understandably, Oedipus is incensed. He calls Teresias a conspirator whose aim is to unseat him and declares his form of divination fake and third rate, referring to him as a peddler of fraudulent magical tricks with eyes wide open for profit, but blind in prophecy. Teresias shoots back and states that if the truth is anyone's defense, then he has escaped any consequence by uttering it, challenging Oedipus, who taunts him for his blindness, to call him blind when he can prove him wrong. I invoke this dramatic moment only as an analogy to illustrate my topic for today. Who is a public intellectual? What is his or her social role? And more importantly, where are our public intellectuals in Ghana? By invoking Sophocles, I seek to underline a couple of things about the Teresias Oedipus confrontation and some of the characteristics that typically define the nature and conduct of a public intellectual. The designation of a blind seer is not only an oxymoron, but it also signifies a deep seatedness of knowledge, sometimes hidden beyond the obvious or what the eye can see. Teresias was summoned into the king's presence because of his competence and deep knowledge, knowledge of law, sacred and profane, all heavenly and earthly knowledge are in your grasp, says Oedipus. In his declaration, Teresias displays independent thoughts in spite of the unequal social positions of the two adversaries, one as a king, the other as a subject. Oedipus indeed threatens Teresias of physical harm and asks him if he expects to escape the consequence. Theresa's response, I have escaped. The truth is my defense. Mm -hmm. The dangers of physical harm notwithstanding, he sticks to what he sees and unswervingly speaks truth to power, insisting on his right to rebuttal when he says, king though you are, one right to answer makes us equal and I claim it. End of quote. As a reminder of the play proofs, Theresa was right. So who is a public intellectual? Hawkins and Karen, set the right tone when they observed that as a proper noun, intellectual has typically imbued its nominee not only with knowledge, insight, and expertise, but also with social, political, and ethical responsibilities to intervene in issues of the day on behalf of the public good. And I want you to underline that, on behalf of the public good. Mm. From the above, the public intellectual is not only is not merely an intellectual who sees himself or herself as autonomous and independent from the ruling social group, believing to stand for truth and reason. He, he or she is also, in Gramsci's words, an organic intellectual in the sense that they emerge from and tie to social classes, speaking on his behalf with a clear advocacy accent. It is this emancipatory project of the public organic intellectual that differentiates him or her as an activist. Someone seeking social transformation, often in contradiction with the dominant worldview of the ruling elite from a simple armchair traditional intellectual. By emancipatory project, by emancipatory benefit of the society, I'm seeking to underline particularly the feature of the public intellectual as a voice of the voiceless and the burden he or she carries by speaking or acting in their interest especially against special elite or corporate interests. It is not always that the public intellectual places their expertise 
to the benefit of the public and the citizenry. There are abundant empirical examples that suggest that they can also serve in various roles within the political system, including economic interests, as advisors, experts, or administrators. In short, truth can be usurped by the intellectually powerful, not always in the public interest. It should be presumptuous, even foolhardy, therefore, to automatically link the knowledge base of such intellectuals to the benefit of the general good. By pointing out that the public intellectual must not only have a politically external and nominally independent rule, but also comment publicly on the social condition with the objective of influencing or guiding its future, Karen and Hawkins sought to differentiate the public intellectual who acts as a guard dog of the system from another who seeks to question it. Yeah. One seeks to reinforce the status quo and its worldview, the other seeks to undermine the status quo through constant interrogation of its knowledge and worldview, and especially on behalf of the marginalized. So before I contextualize my topic, let me tie the knot so far together. One, a public intellectual expresses knowledge, what Aristotle calls a piston, not just opinion. Two, he or she speaks for the public good as against special interest tied to the political system. Three, he or she expresses independent thoughts by remaining external to the political system. And four, and perhaps more importantly, he serves as an advocate seeking through public speech to guide or influence social conduct. Lest I be charged with Afghan Afghanistanism, the <laughs> journalistic sense of focusing on distant matters unrelated to one's audience. Let me now place this topic within our local context and provide some rationale for its choice. One of the things that struck me about the invitation, this invitation to speak at this event, was the event organizers hope that through my topic, I may be able to influence public policy and conduct for our individual or collective progress, end of quote. I hope this encounter achieves that objective. But be it as it may, I begin this reflection from the position that the hope of influencing public policy and conduct is not only one of the fundamental pillars upon which a deliberative democracy thrives and a public intellectual gains expression. It is also one of the cornerstones of our media, especially if they intend to perform their watchdog role rather than a, dog, a guard dog one. A watchdog looks out for threats to the larger society. A guard dog protects, protects those who belong to the kennel and backs the world of threats to their survival. Rather than see consensus, the public policy process could be instrumental in its rationality. It could be very contentious in its performance and it could be very divisive in its outcome. My question about where our public intellectuals are therefore is situated within our current heavily mediated condition and how media, both mainstream and alternative, perform this social watchdog function, either as meaning makers and by that I mean interpreters of social and daily happenings, as chroniclers of our civic life, that is to say, bearing witness and placing events on record, or just as sites where rational critical debate occur as a public sphere. If public policy is for the good and interest of the general public, and as citizens, we are duty bound to partake in this formulation and or implementation, either directly through free expression and debate, or indirectly through our representatives. Then aside boardrooms and privileged access locations where public policy is conducted, our media are one of the sites or conduits through which the process of active engagement between policymakers and the public occur. If we accept this premise, then the nature of our media, including who owns it, its editorial independence, how it is funded, and whose interest it serves, either for power, for profit, or for public interest, hmm. all come together to create a situation where consent is either manufactured, and I'm quoting Herman and Chomsky, or consent is arrived at through rigorous deliberation. I'm arguing that there are two main sites and processes for policymaking. One is privileged with restricted access to carefully selected players, and there are more open others, such as various media sites where social and governance issues get raised and discussed. The closer the citizen can come to inputting into public policy debate. However, while policymaking within privileged sites bring together specialists, politicians, various stakeholders, and selected actors, and occurs beyond the full glare of the public, at the Kabimamin Kemi level, so to speak, 
Active citizenship is subject to what issues the media highlight as worthy of discussion. This includes what issues they select, how they frame and moderate them, i.e. the quality of the discourse, and more importantly, whether the discussions within the public sphere get considered within the privileged access policy sphere. My interest here is, why is a public discourse, especially about governance, getting so uninformed, hmm. but now hyper-partisan and uncritical? Why have party communicators become the yardstick through which policy positions of, party, of political parties get articulated, often incoherently without empirical data? Why has it become attractive to simply pitch two adversaries with irreconcilable party positions as panelists to discuss issues while a presenter only allocates time rather than moderate? Many factors account for this. But my substantive argument here is that such a setting, what I call the gratification of conflict and irreconcilable differences, is typically polluted by opinions, incendiary language, and uncritical fellowship. Such situations generate what we we'll call simultaneous monologue and remains on, it remains antithetical to true conversation. Even when public intellectuals are invited to contribute into such programs, the program formats are so unsuitable that little impact is made. Caught between the existential threat of abusive language by parties who are callers and their benefactors, and the thankless job of being derided and ridiculed, many knowledgeable subjects who could perform the function of public intellectuals have chosen to keep mute and look on. Mm. At best, they choose to make their positions known on platforms that are not mass, but specialized, including inaugural lectures, policy papers, journal articles, opinion pieces, and sometimes on specialized social media platforms. I'm arguing that the media has the sacred duty of creating an enabling environment for all, including those who hold uncomfortable social positions. It should look out particularly for knowledgeable subjects with something to say, to step up to the table, to contribute their knowledge. The media should partner such public intellectuals in a way that supports them to, set, to disseminate their knowledge in an easy to understand and digest language for a mass audience. This is a critical part of the, of the puzzle the ability to massify specialized knowledge. The key to achieving this is through a collaboration between the public intellectual and the media, through a careful selection of subject matter, program format and moderation, and how such content gets repurposed in other media, especially social media for mass dissemination. So rather than increase the decibels of the current Tower of Babel, which characterizes our media, mm -hmm. media programs should aim at providing public intellectuals with the space the instruments and the enabling environment to articulate and share their knowledge with the public in ways that inform and frame critical social issues of our time. Media should even encourage uncomfortable and unpopular views and subject them to rigorous analysis and test because this is how societies expand their horizons and undergo transformation. The media should be also cognizant of the fact that institutions could also perform the functions of public intellectuals by virtue of their depth of specialized knowledge and their vision to uplift society through enlightenment. So you can take the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, the universities, think tanks, special knowledge, uh, CSOs, they must all be encouraged to actively participate in public discourse with the intention to impact public policy. But as Bennett and Herman rightly point out, a policy sphere that fails to consider outcomes of a deliberative public sphere fails a critical test. In view of this, I'm proposing that there should be clear pathways through formal, that is public, and informal, private rules, for such knowledge to be harnessed and considered at the privileged access policy table. If politicians and policymakers are honest about their policy or social inter interactions, and such encounters are not instrumental by nature, and by I mean they are not guided to achieve specific outcomes, they will be acting like it to the tutorials, inviting public intellectuals to the policy table at both privileged and open access sites because they have something substantive to say, not because they are friendly or critical voices. I'm looking forward to the day when 
intellectually diverse and vibrant social media platform, such as the Writers Cafe of Ghana, which I belong, a social media platform for the Ghana Association of Writers, or the Communication Educators Association of Ghana, who take it upon, it upon themselves to select, debate, and articulate a policy position on, say, the podcasting bill, public funding for state-owned media, on how digital migration and convergence could alter our media experience. And beyond table it as a policy position to government, also vigorously advocate for its public debate and implementation. My renowned Ghanaian, many renowned Ghanaian statesmen uh, with remarkable achievements have expressed consternation about how VS and uh, other critical public pronouncements have been received with partisan hostility. Professor Kwesibuche in particular has asked for decorum in our public discourse and call for more inclusiveness in public discourse and policy formulation. Sir Sam Jonah, Mr. Kwame Pinim, and a few others are abiding examples of this regrettable phenomenon of how intolerance and name calling almost invariably visit critical voices that dare to go against the grain of dominant political discourse. We must not only encourage critical public interest debate at the policy formulation level, we should even at the Kambi Maminkambi level of daily social interactions, strive to create a critical culture of close interrogation of facts and pronouncements of speakers within such communicative spaces. That is what differentiates a deliberative democracy from a moralizing democracy. Rule of law from institutional arbitrariness. Let me conclude the same way I started, by invoking a literary example. Aristotle argues that the twin feelings of pity and fear that a spectator experiences after watching a tragedy comes about because the punishment of the tragic hero, who is often of a very high social standing, evokes fear in the ordinary spectator. Because of course, the ordinary spectator will be asking if somebody of high social standing can be reduced to rubble by the gods, then what will happen to me, an ordinary man? But it also evokes pity in the sense that the punishment the tragic hero suffers is often disproportionate to the offense committed. So let's say Oedipus, the king of Thebes, plucks his eyes and is led into the wilderness after learning that he indeed had killed his father and married his mother as the Vishas had prophesied. I conclude by asking you that if the high and noble statesmen within our society, with intellectual, political, economic, and social capitals, are taken to the cleanest for voicing critical alternative views, what do you think will happen to the low level public intellectual whose only recomp recompense and protection is the truth he or she projects through his knowledge? I'm um, at this point not merely asking where are our public intellectuals? I'm inviting them to step up to the policy table, knowing that they might never be called to it otherwise. And like Theresias, expand our social frontiers through shared knowledge and enlightenment. Lastly, I devote this reflection to Professor Pierre Vianza whose deep insights into our daily lives serve as a prime example of how a public intellectual can, through his writings, debate, denounce, deconstruct, be humorous, or even go to town if he's sufficiently provoked. Needless to say, we need more of his kind. Samson, thanks for your time. I have to say that um, it's an overwhelming privilege to have been given the opportunity to just talk about the things that are on one's chest on a forum like this. And I want to thank um, Joy and also to thank you for deeming me um, somebody that, that should be given that privilege. So the nature of my presentation, it's going to be a bit e eclectic. So please bear with me. Also, um, you'll find that um, I have, uh, the, you know, the previous speakers have said a lot of what I wanted to say and so eloquently. So I'll just add a few things on some of those issues before turning to those which may not have been, um, have been touched upon. I want to say that um, I want to call out some of the toxic cultures that have developed around key spheres of public life, which I believe threaten to undermine the real advancement towards the goals of a free and just society. And the second point I want to make generally is that I want to make a plea for the ownership of our legacies as a key to the transformations that we 
require. And in that process, I'm also looking at my generation and our handling of the responsibilities of building upon the efforts of the independence generation, which uh, was just ahead of us. So if we look at um, culture, sustained and marked behavior of a society, which is generational, and culture as our identity, and um, we want to begin to wonder what is our culture and what is our identity. Um, it's certainly not a monolithic thing. It's certainly um, a complex one. But I uh, would want to agree with um, Professor Prempe, um, uh, Ms. Jibunuku, um, um, for the points that they made about governance, because I think that that's one of the most toxic areas of, of the development of, of, of culture, which we need to stop and take a look at. There's no time to go into the legacy of colonialism um, and the encounter with Europe, but perhaps there will be other platforms on which to discuss the need to be conscious of how severely we have been impacted by that encounter and how it has affected areas such as governance. Um, you, many people you know, feel that uh, we are beyond you know, colonialism and so on, but uh, I'm afraid that uh, the impact has been extremely deep-seated and we need to, to take a look at that. I also want to pick a tourism developed by Professor George Chikata and her inaugural address last week to the effect that there are many Ghanas which we ignored at the national level to our peril. So if we take Ghana, uh, looking at it, we are still communal in nature. Our traditional leaders help us to maintain law and order and are essential in the settlement of non-criminal civil, civil disputes, for example. Um, decisions in communities regarding peacekeeping, conflict resolution, and matters that relate to social issues such as health, community welfare, and many others are placed under the guard, guidance of traditional authorities at the local level. However, we also know that chieftaincy is one of the core blocks of Ghana's culture um, in which um, should uh, you know, preserve our rich culture values and communality um, and such principles as reciprocity, hospitality and citizenry. But uh, we know that it has suffered from some of the most grievous distortions, especially dating from the colonial period, leading to the emerging reality that while these leaders um, sustain commun community unity um, on, on the one hand, it is also a source of uh, communal strife around matters of succession and language, land use. And I want to say Sebi uh, Tafrache to my, my um, elders, that you know, some of these things have to be put on the table because it's um, an institution that the people look up to and which must therefore you know, be able to stand um, tall in, 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 in supporting those aspects of our culture, which um, will keep us going forward. So communal Ghana evolves in spite of, rather than because of national systems and structures, which are supposedly set up to support them. And there's a lot that must be done to keep the people at the center of national governance systems. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, Nanakufi has also talked about that. Now, one of my greatest concerns, which seems to be the concern of many of our speakers, is, that, is the culture of national governance that has evolved, um, and especially if we take the last 30 years, um, you know, of the fourth uh, Republican constitution, where we opted for multi-party democracy. Um, it's an aspiration to entrench the democratic principles within the framework of constitutional rule, as we've been told. But, um, and we can be proud of an unbroken pro uh, process of um, elections handing over, you know, power from one political tendency to another. But um, is the duopoly and the normalization of monetization of elections, state capture, 
a parliament which has shown its potential for has shown its potential for greatness, but is imploding on itself. Are these the um, you know the are these the the, the characteristics um, of of a national governance system that we as a people um, would want? Are we as a people not reduced to watching a contest within a small group of people whose aim is to hold on to power for their own benefit with little accountability to the people? Is this the Ghana we bargained for? Is this the Ghana that our people, our elders fought for, as Amu um, says in Yenara Asasini? A related area of this toxic toxicity is the consistent disruption of systems in the public sector every time there's a change of government so that no solid institutional memory is sustained, systems are not allowed to work. So changing an entire board membership and all the senior executives every four years, for example, is taking out of their hand the prerogative to manage an orderly and regulated system and to entrench an orderly and regulated system. And this certainly is not serving as well. There's also what I call the cancel culture. I know this is not what um, those who use it normally uh, use it for, but I call a council, I'm using it, you know, to talk about the idea of the, that the fact that we are not, as a matter of fact, um, looking at, you know, the regulatory framework and, and the legal a, a framework that 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 we are putting together, such that we are piling on rules, laws, regulations, which are end up in conflict with each other, and in the end create a stasis or cancel each other out. So, if you take the cultural sector, which I'm better uh, um, um, acquainted with, after the sitting up of the National Commission on Culture under the under the President CPNDC Law Two Three Eight. Ministries were later established um, above the, the, the commission. Institutions like the National Theatre, which were under the purview of the National Commission, now were allowed to amend their laws. Um, the, now we have the creative arts industry. And what we have now is a morass of laws um, and institutions which don't know how to relate to each other. Now, the point is that who is doing the necessary and painstaking work of weighing and recalibrating the impact of piling legal and supervisory entities on each other generally and, uh, and, 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 and making it difficult for the system to work? And I'm sure that this is not just happening um, um, in, 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 uh, in, in the area of culture. It's happening in so many areas if we think about medium, small, uh, and small scale businesses um, and the fact that they seem to be sinking in the face of tax regimes and prohibitive interest rates. Um, and we have the situation that's happening with grains and, and so on where we are supposed to be processing them here and then we've given permission for people to, to, to export them. And, you know, it, it's, it's somehow timing um, synchronization and so on. The absence of a view, a good view on, on this uh, and, and regulating this is getting us to really um, sync. Uh, and this doesn't even, I don't even talk about it being what is worsening, it being the appalling cultures of corruption. Now, one of the things that really terrifies me is the ease with which we cede control um, of our precious resources. Um, it is as if the last 500 years never happened. It is as if we don't know that our people were sold um, to build up Europe and America. It is as if we don't know that our gold is, has been taken from under our feet um, on terms that are not favorable to us. Uh, it is as if we are not aware that, that um, our land is currently being bought by foreign uh, foreigners and, and then resold to us. Um, it is as if we are not aware that our indigenous knowledge, arts and philosophies cultivated over years are being taken without, uh, are, in, are supervising how 
we interact with other peoples regarding these very, very precious uh, um, knowledge systems. And, and, and we are not also looking at how they are constantly being used to serve Europe, America, China over, over the centuries and even up to today. Um, so when are we going to systematically and strategically put a value on each of these resources to stop the horrible hem hemorrhage? Value being put on our resources. Um, people are not coming here because they love us. And they come here because we have resources that, that they think will be useful to them. Why we don't recognize the importance of these resources is what is really terrifying to me because many of them are not retrievable, um, they are not replaceable, and they put us in, um, God forbid, a really tenuous position as we go into the future. Now I want to, to just raise uh, a few other issues. One of them is the, the fact that our social fabric it has been very seriously affected um, by the approach that, that we have taken. What have our people become? How have their values and the social fabric been distorted and compromised in the process that we have talked about? Has commoditization and transactionality become our identity? An identity of self-denigration so that we don't even see any strengths, which are me, I mean, so me this is Ghana, nothing works here. And it is tough to hear young people say, mommy, these days it's money and nothing else. Um, what is it that has gone wrong with our parenting and nurturing? What has it has have gone wrong with our religious institutions um, that we are not able to nurture persons who have a sense of pride, have a sense of integrity, and yet program after program, doctrine after doctrine, um, we see being advertised and being carried out within our religious institutions. Um, what, what, what is happening there? And as parents, why is it that we feel that our children should become faded copies of superficial Europe and America? It's sad to see parents failing to transmit fully our own knowledge that that has been passed on to us. And many of us are multilingual and we turn our children into monolingual children. We pay loads of money to alienate our children from our culture. Um, you, we have young minds being molded in nursery schools and by electronic media with iconographies which sit with them for the rest of their lives. So Mickey Mouse, Snow White, um, and so on. And even in poor communities, um, we, they do not know the, their own heroes. They do not have an idea of African, the, the African imaginary and, and the African reality. Now, this is a terrible travesty. And um, this is why I believe that any person in position of responsibility must have the capacity to recognize our resources and should not be willingly or willfully contributing to the dissipation of these resources. Um, I, I, I might, the way I sound, I might be counted among Afro-pessimists or Ghana pessimists, those who have given up. Um, but I want to say that for the remaining time, uh, I want to acknowledge those who have kept the flame burning, those who are innovating faster than we even can keep pace with. If Ghanaians were total cynics, the way I sounded before, why would there have been a palpable wave of relief and hope when COP Dr. Dampari was made AGP? It means that right at you know the at our base, we crave for integrity. We crave um, for a system that works. Um, I want to appreciate the culture of civil consciousness that continues to be molded through the work of civil society groups, and um, and also among the citizenry. If for nothing at all, just a few days ago, the surge of well-articulated demand for accountability regarding plans for the African motor forest speaks to this. Of course, um, this must be tried and tested um, if the need arose to persistently battle for it. But I want to, to appreciate that. 
I want to appreciate every single individual who wakes up in the morning to put in an honest day's work. And there are millions of Ghanaians who do this every day. This is one of the most important tenants of our cultural heritage, and I want to appreciate that. I want to appreciate everyone who works in an official position and has not extorted money or other favors, including sexual for members of the public. I'm privileged to have been in public service, and I know that I myself and others have been capable of holding these offices with integrity. I don't buy into the idea that people cannot be fair, um, cannot, cannot work with integrity, I, the, what we have to do is unearth these stories and share them um, and, and, and share the fact that in doing this, one remains with a sense of freedom and peace of mind and with a capacity to interact um, with, with our society. I want to appreciate all those who are researching and documenting our intellectual um, heritage, our, our knowledge, indigenous knowledge, resources and ways of life. I also want to appreciate those who are exploring technology to promote an interest in Ghana. Vloggers, YouTubers, those who are going to the trouble of seeking and putting together information on language, on food, on natural environment, on performance, on the arts, on the return of the diaspora. These are people who should, whose work should be, should be moved up into mm. a level where it's officially recognized. Thank you. I want also to appreciate those who recognize us uh, uh, who embrace the total range of resources from home and abroad. So to mm. end, my, rec my recommendations are that we, we cannot just throw money at our problems. Where we are today, we must have a people who are inspired. Without an inspired people, we are not going to make any, any difference. We are going to sink into a morass of... Um, self-denigration and therefore um, telling the story, the story which strengthens us, which recognizes us, which acknowledges us and our whole family from community level mm. to national level to the African level across the diaspora, our whole story of resistance, of enterprise, of worth across time and space. Um, people like Nanaka telling the story, the story of Asamini, of the Akwamu, of Nani, of the Maroons, mm. Priscilla Mante, the neuro, neuropharmacist, um, Leticia mm. Bing, our zoologist, Professor Konate Ahulu, and so on. Right. Um, we must tell those stories. Thank you. Um, and, and that, for me, um, the, including that and the harmonization of our policies, laws, and institutions, and finally, um, I would like to say that um, if we do not turn to an alternative path of, 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 of the economy, um, and, and I'm suggesting that that culture would be one of those alternative paths, um, we probably are not going to, 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 to make it. And therefore, that idea of um, transformational thinking mm. um, must, uh, must take, take a hold of our minds and must drive us. We, um, as we move forward. Thank are, you very much, Ladi. We are extremely thankful to you. Thank you very much, Samson. And a very good morning to your viewers and listeners. Samson, we've been at this journey for about 20 years now. And in all these 20 years, we've been asking ourselves very fundamental questions questions as to what kind of society do we want? What kind of system would bring about that society that we so much yearn for? And as we have been at this, we came to no other conclusion that we ought to look at our laws. Some of the questions that arise is, are the fact that where are our laws coming from? And so you take the example of the Plant Breeders' Bill. And when you read the Plant Breeders' Bill of Chile, of Taiwan, of Japan, of all the other countries where they have been tabled, including that of Ghana, very little changes. I mean, and so we ask ourselves, where are our laws coming from? Uh, laws coming from, I mean, are they rooted in, how do you call it, um, 
African philosophy, for instance? Are they coming from us? These are, for us, questions that we may want to go into, I mean, in, in, in the near future, but for the lack of time. Now, you take the idea of corruption, fighting corruption, and we'll talk a lot about it, oh, we'll do this, we'll do this, but more often than not, they are not practical, because the ideas only suggest that we are going to deal with the individual. When we all know that corruption um, has social implications, so if it has social implications and uh, African etymology or African philosophy suggests to us that when a man or a woman misconducts himself or herself, the shame does not come to just the man alone or the woman alone, but it comes to the family. Where do we find this line, this trick of social philosophy in the African setting in our laws. And so one of the things that the Economic Fighters League will do will be to impose what we call the thief tax, where when a man is said to have stolen from us, we don't waste our money by accommodating that person in prison and feeding that person and catering for the medical expenses of that person. We are not going to do that. What we seek to do is to let that person live within the society and face the social shame thereof. But it is not just him going to repay our monies, I mean, to us. It is also going to be imposed on the family members and beneficiaries, including the churches they attend, or the mosque or religious settings that they find themselves in. So in our course for a new constitution, one of the subject matters that hasn't come up, which is framed in a question is, so what do you want to see in that new constitution? Today we want to present just one of the things that we want to see in that new constitution. And we are talking about proportional representation. We believe that there is a winner takes all problem in our politics. And it has been suggested many times. And because there is a winner takes all I mean, problem in our politics, um, it has led to what we call the politics of exclusion. The vast majority of our people are not engaged in the politics of our country. Now, this is what we are presenting as the solution. And we are looking at proportional representation in the light that it identifies three very important, and that is not to say the rest are not, but these are more or less in the majority. We are talking about women. We are talking about youth. We are talking about people who belong to the, 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 the physically challenged community and those also within the brackets of um, uh, the professional class whose ideas and involvement may be very um, necessary in legislation and yet are nowhere to be found in in our politics. Okay, so what is proportional representation? It's basically an electoral system where parties are represented in decision making proportionate to the percentage of votes they get at the national level. So if we want to use the 2020 electoral results as, as an example, then PP secured 51% nationally. What it means is that they would, currently they have 137 seats in parliament. What it would mean is that they would have 141 seats in parliament under a proportional representation system. Then DC that had 47%, currently with 137 seats in parliament, would have had 130 seats in parliament. And this country would have had the benefits of the likes of GUM, who would have been represented with two seats in parliament. So in all the brouhaha going on, all the noise, in all the conversations happening in parliament, the tensions and all of that, Ghanaians would have had the opportunity to hear what Goom is saying. But because of the current system we are practicing, we do not have the benefit of their voice. Now, proportional representation is very flexible, such that Many countries adapt it to their particular circumstances. So if you go to the likes of Denmark, South Africa, Germany, Rwanda, they have their own type of proportional representation. 
And we believe that here in Ghana, we can have our own type of proportional representation. Now, if you take the, a look at the population demography, um, men, women, women constitute about 50.7% of the entire population, and men constitute 49.3% of the entire population, which simply tells you that men, women are more than men in this country. And yet when it comes to the decision-making table, women are almost nowhere to be found. It's quite surprising, something that um, quite a significant number of gender advocates or activists um, aren't talking about proportional representation. They are instead talking about um, affirmative action. Now, by proportional representation, we are breaking the hands of patriarchy, which is what the gender activism is all about. It's about breaking the hands of patriarchy and establishing a system which, which, which is fundamentally equal for all who live in it. We are also looking at the other constituency. I mean, we are talking about youth who, I mean, also constitute a majority in a, in a, in a, in a society and yet, and yet are nowhere to be found in decision making. Today, ask yourself, what roles do young people and women play in our politics? They are cheerleaders. Cheerleaders. Wait until election time, get them t-shirts, and unfortunately, I mean, for, for women, they are simply sexualized. Then, I mean, it becomes a back, a back raise than a raise of, 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 of the mind and ideas in contribution to, to, to what must change and what must be retained. So, now, there are some who have raised the idea of possible dangers in, in, in a system like this. They have said that it, leads to, it can lead to unstable government. And that's, this is why we, 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 we bring in what we call the, the proportional representation that can be tailored for Ghana's own. One of the things that we are looking at, for instance, is that this proportional representation should happen at the parliamentary level. At the presidential level, look, we, 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 we even advocate that the 50% plus one that has to be secured under our current system of first past the post should be scrapped to a simple majority. So it's, 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 the proportional representation does not happen at the executive level. It happens at the parliamentary level to give voice to, 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 to our people. Now, why do we want proportional representation for Ghana? We want proportional representation for Ghana in order to pro promote the politics of inclusion. We want more women. We want more youth. We want our best and scarce brains. I don't think we are making a very good use of the likes of Kweku Bakwa and Kwesi Prat in this country. We have reduced them to radio talks and, 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 and television programs, and that's, that's just it. But with proportional representation, these knowledgeable men and women we have in our society could have a place to, to, to as it were, influence policy conversations and discussions and all of that. Proportional representation promotes a politics of conviction. How many of our men and women in politics are in there because of conviction and not because of their stomach or not because of, I mean, survival? This is what we are talking about. If we left the likes of Atik Mohammed, very brilliant guy, yet. If we left the likes of Bernard Bonner, brilliant guy, yet. Politics of conviction has its own place. And if we would allow for, 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 for that kind of politics in our country, I believe that this country would be the better for it. Now, we also want to make the best use of our human resources, like I have already said. And then one of the things that we are looking at in this new constitution is to strip parliament of um, what um, parliamentary um, representation or constituency representation and just leave that to the DCs. If you want development in your, in your constituency, go to your DC. They will construct the gutters, they will construct the roads, they will build the hospitals, leave parliament to, 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 to represent their political parties. And in truth, if we want to, to, to be truthful with ourselves, our members of parliament, do they speak to the concerns of their constituency 
or they speak to the concerns of their party. On E-Levy, how many of them spoke on the concerns of their constituency? And if they did, E-Levy would not have been passed. And so let us organize or have a system that allows, I mean, us to operate on the principle of honesty. And we believe that proportional representation is one of the ways by which we can, we can, we can do that. Now, the new constitution will be a development-led one. And proportional representation is a right system to galvanize the nation, I mean, towards, towards it. We also want a change of the electoral system from first past the post to proportional representation, like we have said. We want the, um, and this is another idea, we want a second chamber. And by this second chamber, we want the collapse of um, the Council of States and the National House of Chiefs into this, how do you call it, second chamber. It's a lot of compromise. By ideological conscription, we don't even believe in that. But, I mean, for, for, for the sake of our uh, 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 cohesion, we feel that the second chamber would bring all of these people on board. Uh, now, okay, so that's, that's basically it. We've talked about... Um, We've talked about the need for, 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 for the proportional representation to happen just at the parliamentary level right. so that we can have, how do you call it, the executive uh, elected on simple majority. Right. Good morning, Samson. And then uh, uh, good morning also to our listeners and viewers as well as our other um, panelists. I must say something that I want to commend you and also your production team for your interest in inclusivity and for that matter, ensuring that there is gender you know, consideration in your programming. And let me say that I listen with great interest and I am learning a lot from the other great speakers. Before I, I talk about the issues of gender vulnerability and social protection, I want to quickly make a few comments on my observation in this Ramadan. Um, and it's towards the, the, the contribution of religion. Uh, I have seen that in this Ramadan, there is an increase in the you know, sensitization in general um, sermons around the protection of women and the vulnerable. And I think that it calls for commendation, uh, as you might have heard, uh, Madam um, A.C. Sutherland, and for that matter, uh, Mr. Kofi Aqua, all bringing in the issues of religion. And this observation for me, I think, will call for us to collaborate more with religion, to see how they can use their space to further, you know, push towards getting women the emancipation that we need. Nonetheless, I would like to talk briefly about uh, women or gender vulnerability and social protection in the eyes of our current happenings with our economy. And uh, Samson, you know that um, women are, you know, almost half of our human population. And yet we get to suffer the gross inequality gaps, either in income or human capital and the like. Uh, if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, women face deeply rooted obstacles to achieving their potential at work and also in other aspects of life. However, evidence suggests that persistent gender inequality affects women and it will impede you know, economic and social progress in our development. Um, I am bringing all of this so that we can appreciate, um, you know, how whichever way the economy is, how it's likely to hit women either negatively or otherwise. And because I'm coming from the North, I would want to talk about women farmers who have significantly have less access to and control over an ownership of land and other productive assets you know, compared to their male counterpart. You know, land perhaps is the most important economic asset and women account for just about 12.8% of this ag agricultural, you know, uh, um, input. Of course, you can understand from where we are coming, we have issues of male dominance and patriarchy. 
And so discriminatory gender and social norms, you know, limit access to, to, to women having, you know, uh, access to productive resources. Now, with the current happenings with our economy, where we have high inflation, coupled with arbitrary increase in goods and services, especially food, it's also greatly affecting women and other vulnerable groups. We have had increase in, you know, farming input. For example, when you take a market survey of the farm input that we have, talk about plowing, talk about surrogate, talk about fertilizer, you would see that there's about 87% price change from last year, from what we have from last year to this year, you know. And even if you take the cost of a bag of maize, which is our staple, it's about 300 Ghana city. And how does that translate and impact on women? And for that matter, you know, people with very large family size. Um, in, in, from where I come from, women are particularly are those who should do whatever that they can to make sure that the bag of corn that is being placed to you, you do whatever you have to do in order to make sure that it becomes a meal. Now, how are women bedding in this? Especially now that we do not have vibrant national economy to withstand the shocks. We are just recovering from COVID. And we have all, we all woke up to see what COVID did to us. And yet we are not making effort in making sure that we are learning from COVID. Now, a lot of the reasons for our current happening is blame on the Ukraine, uh, you know, German, uh, Ukraine war. And what are we then learning? Because whether we like it or not, it has effect on fertilizer, it has effect on fuel, and also maybe wheat, which we also somehow consume. Now farming season has started. I don't know what programs are there yet, but even fertilizer is not very much accessible for now. Now, how does this trend of economic hardship also affect gender and vulnerability? We've noticed that only people with voices and representation are heard, as we've seen in the industrial strike, as we've seen in you know, unions, asking for increase in salary, asking for increase in, 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 in you know, ways that will make them comfortable enough to absorb this shock. What about the less privileged I have been asking? What about the rural women with diversified needs? Women who are pregnant, women who are single-headed households, who have a lot of children to feed by themselves. How about people with disability and the excluded? If all of these people are this hard hit, how about my women who are excluded and are living in alleged witches camps, who have been forgotten for ages? How are they managing the situation? And I think that this calls for us all to, as a matter of agency, and I think as a matter of agency, to enact, in fact, a very universal social protection program that are adequately funded and that will benefit mainly the poorest people. And I've been asking, I know the social protection bill has been there. What has happened to it? What's happening to it? And I think that it should be a matter of priority. Each passage should be a matter of priority. I know that governments have taken three months or less to ensure that the laws that they want to see it happen, happens. So I've been asking, is it that this country is not interested in the excluded? It's not interested in bridging the gender gap? Because if not, women's rights organization have been calling for the passage of the affirmative action bill. We've also been calling for government to you know, look again, if we need to retable, you know, the, 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 the um, social protection bill, we need as a matter of agency to pass that. And then I also want to challenge the media and of course the civil society to so get and hide stories of how the economic impact is hitting, you know, the citizens, especially our rural folks. And I want to ask the media, to also create spaces for the citizens to you know, actively participate 
in issues of our national discourse. And that's why I commend this program, Samson, that it's a very splendid program that will allow other people to bring their views and to help all those of us who are in power to put things right. And then also looking at the fact that issues that are confronting women are quite deep-seated, you know, they are quite systemic. We need to also build partnership. And it's, it's one of my acts that we need to build partnership with our religious and traditional authorities towards changing these deep-seated cultural, you know, bottlenecks that impedes the overall growth of our women. And I want to end by saying that we need a, 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 an agent response to support rural communities, because we know that rural communities, there's nothing else they do except farming. And with this high cost of input, I barely don't know how we can survive that. If a, corn of, a, a bag of maize is already selling at 300 CD, and with our northern sector, which is mostly rain-fed, and our traditional method of farming, coupled with our traditional method of farming, and the high cost of input, we are watching and looking at a glaring, a very scary you know, issue of food insecurity coming up next year. Thank you very much. These are my submissions in looking at gender vulnerability and social protection in the eyes of our of our current happenings with our economy. Thank you very much, Lamnatu Adam. Good morning again, and uh, good morning, viewers. Uh, it's um, thank you for the invitation, and um, I think I've heard some very, um, very enlightening uh, and powerful presentation from my colleagues. We should be thanking um, you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me. Um, um, let me start as follows. Um, so from where I sit and the experience I've had, um, there is no question in my mind that uh, the country is in need of constitutional reform. Um, there is no question in my mind that the current two-party system uh, is not yielding the benefits that we all, effectively two-party system, even though we we, we have provision for other smaller parties, is not yielding the benefits uh, that we, we all hoped for back in 1992 when the constitution was first put together. And, and, and why do I say that? In, in some respects, um, we've heard a lot of the reasons why I thought uh, Kwesi Prempe's presentation in particular was very, um, very broad in helping us understand but, but clearly, my perspective is that there is too much power vested in the executive. Um, and that goes all the way down to the district. We talked about district elections. Mm. Uh, the, the, the president has the power to appoint uh, many of the senior members of the legislature, uh, has the power to appoint uh, boards, of state-owned enterprises. And this system we have effectively where it's a winner take all uh, pretty much means that we have a four to eight year cycle of political management. Uh, what I also believe and what I see is that our political managers are the same as our economic managers. Uh, we have a situation where our private sector is not particularly big. Uh, most small businesses will tell you how difficult it is to access credit in this country. Uh, interest rates are very high. So we, over the years, have not built up the kind of private sector that we need to basically power the economy forward. And we have a government uh, with all these state-owned enterprises that runs a lot of our key areas. Uh, a lot of these organizations tend to be bloated. They are not particularly efficient and they're not generating the kind of outcomes that um, we need to see for the benefit of the country. This is certainly my view. And all of that for me uh, goes back to the kind of institutional and constitutional framework that we have 
basically had in place for the last 30 years. So uh, hopefully you heard my introductory comments. That is so. Um, so the gist of it for me is that we are caught in these four to eight year political cycles, um, which we're all very familiar with. What really aggravates the situation for, for many of us who work in the economy is that our political managers are effectively the same as our economic managers. Mm. We have a small private sector, and whether you look at uh, the petroleum industry, the electricity industry, the insurance industry, many of these companies are dominated by state-owned institutions that are also appointed by our political managers. So effectively what we have is also a very short-term economic management view. And um, that is why the road from Accra to Cape Coast is the same road we've had for the last 40 years. Mm. That is why the road to Kumasi is the same road we've had for the last 40 years. We cannot, it seems it's very difficult for us to think long-term and to execute long-term. Uh, you know, a few years back, we tried through the National Development Planning Commission to put together a 40 year plan, it didn't go anywhere for various reasons. And, you know, when our parties come into power and they give lift surface to this idea of a long term plan, it is quickly abandoned uh, for the various short term parochial interests that we tend to have. So let me just take two examples in spaces that I'm familiar with. Uh, just to make the point. Let's talk about energy for a minute, electricity. So, you know, lately, uh, many people have been complaining that there's doom so, even though there's really not doom so. There's a lot of problems in the transmission and distribution space. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, the SOEs have presented tariff increases of over 100% in, in certain cases. Uh, what I found particularly interesting this year, or this week rather, was a headline in the Business and Financial Times where the head of the IPP industry was saying the industry or the IPPs were owed close to a billion dollars in arrears of unmade payments. Hmm. So you, you ask yourself, so from a certain point of view, um, things are okay. Uh, Ghana has an installed capacity of over 5,000 megawatts. Uh, if you look through the reports, actually only about 4,000 are available. And already uh, we are using somewhere between 150 to 200 megawatts a year in terms of uh, new or using up that capacity we have. What does that mean? Uh, it means that in three to four years time, um, we will be um, over 4,000 megawatts. Um, and if we don't sign new capacity, uh, we will really get uh, the doom saw that we all are so worried about. Now, what are the plans that this government is making to avert that? Um, if we have the IPPs, the private sector saying that I am owed $900 million, as was reported this week, what investor is going to come in and invest in the company, in the country, invest 500, 600, 700 million dollars when he has no assurance that he will get his money back, he has no assurance that those arrears will be paid. How does that relate to you know, a need for a much longer term planning for the things that we do? The fact of the matter is um, many of these issues, the reasons for these arrears are long-standing. Mm. They didn't just happen yesterday. If I were to look through the reports of the Electricity Company of Ghana, for instance, or NEDCO under VRA, you will see that their losses, what we call their technical and commercial losses, are over 20%. When you add the collection issues they face, they're over 30%. Now, guess what? 15 years ago, it was exactly the same. So you have to ask yourself, what exactly, what progress have we made in those last 15 years to actually bring those losses down? 
right. to make the sector efficient. And why is it that these institutions come back to the public and basically say, you've got to give me a 100% increase. You're effectively paying for my inefficiencies. And the point really here is lacking that long-term view of how we properly address some of these issues means we're always focusing on the four to eight year cycle. And it is not allowing us to really address the long-term issues that are still with us 10, 15, 20, 40 years on. Uh, economic management of the management of the state is short term in line with the political management. And that is why in my view, we are in dire need of that constitutional reform to really think through why we give so much power to the ruling party. Let's talk about the economy for a minute. Um, I think many of us will acknowledge that these are challenging times. Extremely. Uh, uh, interest rate uh, as of March, 24%. Um, I'm sorry, inflation as of March, 24%, 23.6 to be exact. We had the money monetary po policy rate go up 17%. It, it may go up some more <laughs> very shortly. And when I look back in time and history, the last time we had those kinds of inflation rates was almost 20 years ago. Um, so now we, we know that there are reasons for this. We know that the, the, the COVID uh, was a big shock to us. We know that the Ukraine-Russian war is a big shock to supply chains. The real question is, are we as a country, how are we managing those shocks? It's not so much whether the shock has occurred, it's how are we managing? Do we have the resilience? Do we have the coherence? Do we have the governance capacity to manage those shocks in a way that some other countries are managing better than we are? And again, for me, it comes back to what are those long-term fundamental frameworks we have in place to build that governance capacity, to build that internal coherence, to build that greater resilience, so that inflation isn't 24%. When you read the media and you hear that UK is at a 40 year high, inflation is 9% and uh, you know the, the sky is falling. What does the man and woman on the street do when inflation is 24%, interest rates are over 20%, how does that person manage their business? Now you may think that it doesn't uh, connect back to the constitution. It doesn't connect back to the need for accountability of our political managers. It doesn't account for the, the sort of the asymmetric power that our leaders have, um, but it does. Because if we're not able to challenge, question, put in place long-term solutions to our problems, if every four to eight years they change, we will be going in cycles. And that is my submission. We need constitutional reform to effectively rebalance the power that is currently inherent in the two-party system. Very revealing. Thank you so very much, uh, Kweku Ando Awoche. Thank you, Samson, and thank you for the invitation to do this. The theme I chose out of the big conversation is that governance standards are in free fall and I have fears that we will normalize it and the thoughts I will share on these are not really new they are the sentiments of a lot of us that I am putting together I say so also because I sample thoughts from many people from diverse backgrounds to put this together I have few words for government especially on the ministry of gender, children, and social protection, and a couple of words also for our press freedom ratings. People my age have lived long enough to witness four government transitions, at least in Ghana. And apart from violent free elections, citizens hope that each transition will offer better living standards, reduce poverty levels, and also reduce inequality. We hope for improvement in access and quality of education. We hope that there's an improvement in public infrastructure, 
we hope that uh, basic amenities like water and electricity will be delivered. We hope that government will implement strategies that will engender the creation of decent jobs and working conditions. The Ghanaian people hardly ask for much. We barely ask for much. We ask for the barest minimum, in my opinion. Our young people are willing to work. They only expect a friendly labor market and humane tax regimes to support them, especially those venturing into entrepreneurship. In 2016, we transitioned with so much hope sold to us in flurry languages. We have the men. I'm sure most of us remember these languages. We are here to deliver world-class governance. I was really impressed by that statement. I can remember where I was sitting when I heard that. We are in a hurry. We are in a hurry got us to also accommodate the huge numbers that we got as ministers. We're willing to accommodate all that because we are in a hurry. The current government enjoy the most goodwill from citizens. With lofty ideas captured in the citing slogans, they convinced all of us that they were right for the governance job. They promised to create jobs, I've mentioned that. But we're here. Income security was one of the promises. Respect for human rights also was one of the promises. People had dreams rekindled in their hearts to see a Ghana where everyone has equal opportunity to flourish. A state where inequality is fought head on. And a just place where all of us thrive in liberty. Today, not only are such dreams dimmed, unfortunately, many people are giving up on ever witnessing a better Ghana. The standard of governance, as I mentioned, is in free fall, with little or no guarantee for upholding freedom of speech and association. No protection against political party-sponsored attacks. There's a total lack of respect for inclusion and citizen participation, in my opinion. Our governance architecture today is making nonsense of who a citizen is. We are subtly dividing, developing a class system where some people's voices matter more than others. I think this is an affront to our democracy, especially when we are participating, we are, um, when we are practicing participatory development, if I can, democracy, if I can put it that way. The management of public institutions are handed over to people like Beth Wrights. They step into these positions feeling entitled to champagne lives. They disrespect long-serving public officials and times their access system to their own benefits. They are not doing this to disrupt the system for the good, no. They do this for their own benefit. More than ever, the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection is leaderless. With a, care a caretaker minister who is undoubtedly overwhelmed by her own responsibilities. In such difficult times, which we all agree, all speakers have mentioned that times are difficult. The most vulnerable of us, the most marginalized of us, require innovative interventions from government to survive. But there's no ministry taking care of that. The only time the minister's absence bothered the presidency was when the minister was needed as a parliamentarian to cast her vote for the e-levy bill to be passed. In actual fact, a levy that was even going to aggravate <laughs> our situation. That's when she was needed. The affirmative action bill, as mentioned by Madame Lamatu, and I retreat here, has not seen any significant progress over the years. In recent years, thrilling conversations have been championed by young people on gender discrimination, sexual exploitation, gender-based violence, reproductive health rights. We've even had issues on period tax, and this is where I, I want to commend one champion of period tax, Abel Delali, my very good friend, who's been giving me a lot of pressure these days. The ministry has failed to harness these renewed passions to advance gender and social transformation in Ghana. For instance, there have been topical domestic violence issues. There's been topical sexual harassment cases. These cases have been worthy of media attention, yet the ministry has been missing in action. 
as a country, the lack of shelter and limited access to justice for victims and survivors of sexual and gender-based violence continue to enlarge, endanger the lives of vulnerable people. These and many others are what a ministry should be doing. They should be leading these charges, championing women and children's rights, and the social protection of the vulnerable. But who is making the case for the different ways in which unemployment impacts women and men? Who is demanding research interventions to address the gender dynamics of unemployment, especially youth unemployment? Who is leading the charge to get women and young people at the decision table where issues that concerns them are being discussed? It's as though the ministry does not exist. And that is unacceptable. Not enough has been done since the passage of the domestic workers regulation either. Several international conventions and to support women's right to work and to stay in jobs remain unratified by parliament. There is no minister to lead that. As a matter of urgency, I think a substantive minister should be assigned with specific tasks and timelines. It's, it's not acceptable. We will not do that to the Ministry of Finance. We will not do that to even the Office of the Chief um, of Staff. Why do we do that to such an important ministry? It's a precedent we do not want. Now, the quest for promoting decent jobs remain a lost battle. While technical and vocational education and training have experienced significant attention over the years, and I must commend the, the government in this regard, training to work transition remains a considerable challenge. We do not have a coordinated strategy to support learners' transition from training to work. Whether as self-employed or even persons to be employed, there does, there's not a clear-cut strategy for this. Government job creation interventions and vehicles are scattered. They are not inclusive and they are not coordinated. There is no directive for such interventions. I hope that the newly established TVET service, which is also something I want to comment government about, will provide policy direction to coordinate such interventions. Skills gap analysis that has been conducted by the Commission for TVET is a place to start from. And I commend the Commission for TVET also for taking such steps. Policies like the school feeding program, LEAP, are best policy of free SHS and other government cushion efforts are facing implementation challenges that could have been avoided. The reason, in my opinion, is that we have a government that does not have money. That is true. But most importantly, we have a government that implements public policies and interventions to shame so-called enemies instead of the common good. So their egos precede the common good. They will not listen to dissenting voices, not even that of experts. They label dissenting voices as their enemies. The human capital component of LEAP, for example, is not receiving the needed attention. This must be given the needed attention through an intersectoral approach, drawing experience from, and resources, in my opinion, from agencies that are responsible for skills development and education as well as relevant development and funding agencies. I was very surprised by government actors being surprised at our 2021 press freedom rating. <laughs> because really, you do not sit aloof, sit in WhatsApp platforms and have a good laugh, watch some party apparatchik sit on social media and haul insults on every dissenting voice and be surprised at your press freedom ratings. You do not create an environment where party field soldiers feel so powerful enough to threaten people, especially activists, with their jobs. You do not pretend to be surprised at your press freedom ratings when state institutions are used to frustrate young activists and expect to score, score uh, high scores on press ratings. High-profile government spokespersons have dismissed the death of Ahmed Swali. Sadly so. We have also gone ahead, ahead, they have also gone ahead to even 
ridicule death threats, that's journalists' reports. What is defined as the press has changed. So establishing TV stations, radio stations, and attempting to control traditional media spaces will not cover up for the bully and dangerous dissenting citizens experience in this country. Many people who otherwise were passionate about governance and held governments accountable have resorted to self-censorship. I am not the only one saying this. Even the report is mentioning this. And this is so because they are disappointed. And also, they are protecting their sanity, as well as, for some, their lives. This is not good for democracy. The standard of governance is in free fall. And I am worried that this will be normalized. I am worried because we have a history of new governments comparing their records to old governments. So as the standards fall, our standard of measurement fall. And that is dangerous. They don't compare their records to even their own manifestos sometimes, let alone to best practices or what is excellence. I am worried about the falling governance standards because it leaves young people with no inspiration. It leaves us with no proper role models and no legacy to protect. Gone were the days when speeches of political leaders were spirited and inspire action in us. We cannot say same in recent years. There's a pervading lack of integrity. What political actors say in their speeches is not what they do. And so it does not cause us to want to move. Integrity matters. And political leadership in this country is leading the lack of integrity that is pervading us. But I am hopeful. I am hopeful not only in feelings, really, because I've come to the knowledge that hope is a strategy of desiring something better and working towards it. And so it is possible. And in this regard, I charge myself and all persons listening, especially those of us sitting on the fence, due to disappointment, those who are nearing despair about the Ghana project, to allow ourselves to feel hope. Let hope seep into our souls. Let it cause a stir in our spirit. And let it move us to some form of action, no matter how little, for a better Ghana. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And uh, I must first of all congratulate you on this innovative program. Thank you. And giving voice to the many and the majority who are often silent. Uh, and perhaps uh, in this program, you can hear them speaking. That's right. Uh, because people are not shouting over each other. And that has been one of the, my pleasant surprises here today, mm -hmm. uh, that I have enjoyed it so much. Thank in fact, you. Uh, I, I want to congratulate you on that. Thank you. Not to mention our last uh, speaker, who was so eloquent. She reminded me of somebody. <laughs> yes. Uh, Dr. Busakara says that she re, uh, Afi uh, Agbenyo's presentation reminds him of uh, Chimamanda. Right. Yes. Mm. So uh, to the issue of redefining our democracy, uh, I think throughout this morning, my task has been made easier because almost all the presenters after making their presentations, have traced the source of our tribulations back to the Constitution. And I think for us uh, in the national interest movement, this is a very important pivotal moment because it shows that persistence over a period of more than six years has brought the issue of constitutional reforms uh, from the rear to the front, where it is now part of the national discourse. Mm. And so many actors are joining hands uh, to push for what we are asking for now, which is a referendum before the next election. And the circumstances demand this. 
both the internal circumstances in the country and, of course, the external circumstances in the world around us. And we cannot have the luxury of continuing business as usual when all around us we see all the familiar things, a mileposts that we were so comfortable with, falling over and changing, almost as if the very earth we stand on itself was moving from under our feet. It would be folly to continue to do business as usual. And that is why, after 30 years of the 1992 Constitution, we must reform the Constitution now, and we must have a referendum before the next election. My presentation is going to focus on how we need, why we need to do that and how we can do it. But I will first like to recap on some of the reasons of why, <laughs> you know, because just to refresh our memory so that it is put in a broader context. Our organization is a nonpartisan organization, and we are focused on constitutional reforms for the past six years. Uh, based on past and current consultative processes uh, that are more or less captured in the uh, Constitutional Review Report, but also captured in the presentations of CSOs, uh, many of them who have also presented today. So it is not a novel idea. Mm. It is a burgeoning demand that our political actors have refused to listen to. And why have they refused to listen to it? Because they have been caught up in the quagmire of a stagnant duopoly where only the politics of equalization is what is heard. And I'm glad that you've given the opportunity for another view to be heard, which is actions for the progress out of the quagmire. And in focusing on those constitutional reforms. They are key areas. They are not exclusive to us. They are shared because they will have pervasive impact if you make those constitutional changes. And we've narrowed them down to seven, but they're by no means exhaustive. exhaustive. Mm. The key one you have heard, which is to redress the imbalance in the power between the arms of states. Many people call it excessive you know, uh, powers of the presidency, but it goes beyond that because there are institutional aspects of it that we need to deal with. I'm not going to go into too much detail in those today because I want to cover ground and get to the imperative of why we must make those changes. But it's fair to say that the major purpose of this would be to resolve the conflicts of interest vis-a-vis -vis the legislative and the judiciary. And we all know what that means in their appointments and also in the appointment of ministers from the legislative, not to mention the control of budgets. You know, so we need to re uh, rectify that. We also need to uh, resolve the conflict of interest of Article 71 holders where more or less you ask me to approve my own salary, you know, uh, and my conditions of emolument. Of course, it will be disproportional to the rest of the, of the people. So we want adjustment in those as well, in terms of the reforms that we seek. Now, uh, when we rationalize those emoluments, uh, we will then have a basis for saying from the income generated, what is relevant to pay a particular person down to the last person. When you don't pay heed to the income we generate and you just start dishing out, of course, it will become like irrigation from Accra to Volgatanga. You know, the first few meters will be over, overly soaked, but from Kumasi going on will be dry. <laughs> and that's what happens in terms of emoluments and remuneration of peoples in the, in, the, uh, in the populace. And then you don't get the buy-in that you want other people to have. So I think we have to be very clear about that. Mm. We also have to be clear about 
accountable political representation at the local government level on non-partisan basis. This is the last front where we can say enough. The political parties have already taken up all the space. Leave the small space of local government for the general populace to elect their leaders on non-partisan basis so that party machinery cannot override the choices of individuals. That is very important. And I cannot state enough that the general feeling of the populace is in support of non-partisan representation because not only does it give us somebody who is, belongs to all of us and we all feel included, uh, but also it allows us to begin the process of experimenting with an alternative form of representation that we can grow organically from the grassroots level. And we hope it will even virtually come to a balance mm. with the partisan one we have adopted at higher level. So it is very important and should not be dismissed lightly. Associated with that is also the imbalance of resource allocation between the center and local government. We must come to a stage in our constitution where a fixed percentage of the revenue, not less than 25% and possibly 35%, is shared by a known formula amongst local governments based on population size and uh, level of infrastructure development and also a catch-up factor giving us additional conditional grant for investing in specific areas that will help those behind to catch up. We cannot just hope by broadcasting the seeds from Accra that the field will be equally germinated. It isn't. We've tried it for so many years. In fact, what we have is a migration from the rural areas into Accra, creating even more problems for infrastructure here. So you've got to do something deliberate. You cannot just do the usual things and hope for something different. Associated with that, you have to ask yourself the question, where are we now with local government in the middle of no man's land? Yeah. Do we want autonomous local governments or don't we? And if we do, are we going to make them financially independent, give them an economy of scale, and also give them accountable leadership? These three things must go together. And I think that we now have too many districts for us to be able to budget for them and for them to be autonomous. And the scale, uh, in terms of the, 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 the economy of scale, they're too small. So we now need to take the bold step of saying, we've tried this, it's had good effects, we can keep the good parts and then eliminate the bad parts. Let us bring back local government to regional level and have about 30, re uh, uh, 30 regions and have local government housed there. Still elect the local government executive on non-partisan basis, so we are like a regional governor instead of a regional minister, and he will have his budget, which we have you know, consigned to him uh, 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 by virtue of our uh, constitutional allocation. That way, not only will we be able to recenter local government where it has scope for growth, an economy of scale to grow, a tax base to develop and, and exist in reality, and not just wait for government subventions, but also we will be housing it where a higher caliber of technical and professional expertise will be happy to live and serve. And we have to be realistic in that you cannot get some of these highly qualified people to go and live and work in some of these existing districts. So, and in any case, we don't have enough of them. So by reducing the number from 260, whatever it is now, to 30, you would be able to reallocate from the center enough people to live in these areas, form a hub, to be able to execute local government uh, together with their regional uh, 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 local government executive. Now, what that would also mean is that the parliamentarians would now need to graduate from looking after constituencies and representing constituencies 
before they come into the executive at the regional level. And from the regional level, you have a way of electing, selecting those that you want to go to the national level. This business of jumping people who perhaps have never seen 5,000 Ghana CDs in an envelope, all the way to look after billions of CDs in the ministry, is ridiculous and we must stop it because it doesn't make common sense. You grow people through experience and through capacity. You don't just jump them into positions and then when you get the results you don't want, you start complaining. Yeah. So we must inbuild the system of growing and maturing uh, leadership and administrative capacity embedded in the system itself. And that will eliminate the business of DCs and MPs always holding each other's shirts at election, who is going to be the MP, you know, and who, because it translates into who might be a minister. All those things are resolved. Now, on the issue of our electoral laws, I'm pleased today to have seen my I don't know whether to call him my son or my political son or my biological son, Ernesto, I start to focus on key areas. And I thought he made a very brilliant submission on the need for electoral reforms and electoral representation and also a first-past-the-post system, which is one of the key elements of uh, the seven-point agenda in terms of broadening representation. Uh, we advocate for the formation of coalition governments. You can use any kind of system you want, we can evolve it ourselves, mm. but the formation of coalition government will eliminate the need to go for a second round after the first round of elections. Now, we ourselves can decide what kind of proportional representation we want, etc. After all, when the British flag came down, nobody asked us, what kind of representation we wanted. We just adopted the, uh, the British parliamentary system. Mm -hmm. So now we have a chance to evolve our own. Right. And it is very important that we do that. Uh, now, the other reason why we want to do this mm -hmm. is also because of the winner-takes-all phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So if you may speak to one last... Uh, yes. Well, the, the, uh, uh, the adoption of a long-term national development plan I think it's very important because it moves us from short-term thinking mm. to long-term thinking. And also, it obviates the need for us to keep improvising manifestos based on promises uh, that we can't keep anyway mm. uh, to manifestos based on milestones within the National Development Plan for a certain segment of uh, development at that time based on our realistic income at that time. So manifestos will no longer be promises. They'll be basically reading of budget statements. If you promise to do A, B, C, and D, mm. how are you going to pay for it? And that is a question we have never asked politicians okay. in Ghana, and we must do that. All right. But I would like to finish lastly on talking about the reasons why mm we must have a referendum before the next election. It will take away many mm. of the things that we have been struggling with and ensure that this post-independence generation mm. is able to bequeath to the fourth Republican generation a constitution that will expand their horizons, mm. allow them to grow and enhance development and remove all the roadblocks that have become entrenched interests right. of the political elite. Thank you. Thank you so very much.